In a report and map prepared by my father in 1943, the Dorset Coasts and Heaths were included as an area to be considered for national park status. And the Dorset Downs also appeared on a reserve list. In my father's white paper of 1945, the Dorset Coasts and Heaths again appeared on the potential list of national parks. And when the Hobhouse Committee came to discuss the matter, the Dorset Coasts and Heaths appeared as number 11 on their first short list of 13 areas. Andrew may note that the South, Cam South Downs came in as number 13. At that moment, my father's comment on the Dorset Coasts and Heaths was, personally, I rank the landscape beauty and recreational value in the highest class. When the committee came to survey the area in Dorset, my father was too ill to be present. But the committee's secretary, John ba da Bowers, reported that while Dorset offers no continuous wild mountain or moorland country comparable to the northern and western national park areas, it does provide within it a comparatively small within a comparatively small area, an unrivaled variety of exceptionally beautiful inland and coastal scenery. However, the prospects of a Dorset National Park in the first phase receded in the face of every refusal by the War Office to contemplate a resumption of public access to the military training grounds in Dorset. This was part of a much larger negotiation with the armed services, which also embraced the training grounds in Northumberland, Dartmoor and the Brecon Beacons. But I believe that it was the reason why Dorset did not remain in the list of priority national parks in the Hobhouse Committee report. You can imagine that my family my brother and I have both been involved in this game, regards this as unfinished business. I said so to the Glover Review team, and I'm delighted that we now have the prospect of serious consideration uh, by the government uh, of, uh, of looking at the Dorset option uh, in strengthening the network of protected protected landscapes. I should say that I am a warm supporter of the Dorset AONB. I sat on the review group for its management plan and I'm working closely with the AONB team in my role as secretary of the Beminster Area Eco Group. But I believe strongly that upgrading the AONB into a national park would benefit the landscape the cultural and historic heritage, the economy and the communities of Dorset, for reasons which have been explained to you by Richard and Sandra at an earlier meeting. I will not repeat their presentation, but I will describe briefly my experience of running the Peak Park as its National Park Officer from 1985 to 92, before I moved to be Director General of the Countryside Commission which was then the, the main agency advising the government on national parks. Directing the Peak Park was a very satisfying job. I had a board consisting of representatives of 12 local authorities, plus ministerial nominees, who were highly supportive of an activist chief officer. We had enough funds and enough varied staff to make good things happen. For the staff included, for example, planners, architects, landscape architect, land agents, two ecologists, two archaeologists, 20 full-time and about 300 seasonal or volunteer rangers, information staff and much else. We owned 4% of the park area 
and used it to demonstrate a high standard of land management. We worked closely with the National Trust, which earned 10% of the park. We also, from the moment that I arrived, began to work closely with the 2,000 farmers in the park, many of whom did not have a good word for the park authority. We pulled together the six different government agencies who were seeking to offer advice and support to farmers for environmental or related work. Within two years, over half of the 2,000 farmers were gaining significant extra income through our linked up agri-environment schemes. I'm looking forward to hearing the parallel stories from the South Downs. We also helped farmers to diversify their income, for example, through tourism. Our rangers were the first line of liaison and troubleshooting between farmers and visitors. We interpreted very actively our duty to, I quote, have regard to the social and economic well-being of the population. We had 3,800, sorry, 38,000 people living in 100 settlements in the park. And for example, as planning authority, we led the process of identifying local housing need and finding sites and developers for sustainable housing, affordable housing, sorry. We supported the creation of small industrial estates by the Rural Development Commission. We initiated the radical rethinking of the cattle market and related facilities in the center of the main town, Bakewell. We turned disused railways into attractive cycle routes. We resolved the capacity problems in areas of highest recreational pressure by buying up and reducing the capacity of the car parks and increasing the capacity of the sites. We provoked the creation of a Peak District Products Association, which, which survives to this day and uh, helps the local economy. Note this, we had a 90% success rate of planning applications because we could afford the staff time to have serious pre-application discussions and to knock out in that way the bad ideas before they got launched. In all, we took a highly integrated view of what my hero, Sir Patrick Geddes, founder of the planning profession, called place, work and folk to the benefit of all three. This ability of a National Park Authority to take a rounded view of the environment, economic and social needs of an area and to take initiative lies behind my belief that a Dorset National Park, working in close liaison with the Dorset Council and many other interests, could bring powerful benefits to this county. I want to say one more thing. I understand that you are interested, you in the society, are interested in the possible effect of a national park on your fine town, and that you hope Dorchester itself would be in the national park so that you could benefit from the park's protection of heritage, promotion of outdoor recreation, and stimulus to social and economic well being. It will be for Natural England to advise on that and for ministers to decide. But I think you can be sure that the town would benefit anyway because ministers have indicated that they expect the protected landscapes of the future to bring benefit beyond their borders. Moreover, I draw on my experience as vice chairman of the Southern Dorset Local Action Group, which for the last seven years has used European funds to grant aid, enterprises and community initiatives in rural Dorset. 
By the Ministry's definition, Dorchester was included in the rural area that we could benefit. Which is why, for example, we, we gave a grant of over £100,000 towards tourism signposting of the town. And I'm glad to hear from the town clerk it's been properly spent. The same principle could well apply to defining the boundary of the National Park. I finish by saying that I'm really chuffed that your invitation enables me to hear the talk by Andrew Lee, because I have heard very good things about the work of South Downs National Park. And I believe that the Dorset National Park could learn from the South Downs experience in order to bring similar benefits to this, my county. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much indeed. That was an excellent introduction to uh, our next speaker, Andrew Lee. And if I just say a few words, if I may, about Andrew, that his first 10 years of his career was spent at the Sussex Wildlife Trust, the last five years as its chief exec. And he has had different posts in, since then, including with the World Wildlife Fund and the Sustainable Development Commission. On the 1st of April in 20, 2011, Andrew took up the post of Director of Strategy and Partnerships at the South Downs National Park Authority and is now Director of Countryside Policy and Management following a restructure in 2016. Andrew is particularly interested in restoration of biodiversity at a landscape scale and all aspects of sustainable development. So Andrew, thank you very much. It's over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Tess, and it's great to be in such august company today, and I very much enjoyed your introduction, uh, Michael, and I recognise many of the things you talked about. Um, I'm going to speak for about half an hour uh, this evening, um, just to give you a little bit of a flavour of the journey that we've been on in the South Downs National Park, and maybe to reflect a bit on what some of the benefits might be for Dorset, but also for Dorchester itself, of being in a national park if that comes to pass. Um, and then we've got some time, I think, for, for questions and answers at the end. So I'm very happy to, uh, um, you know, uh, talk to you in any way I can about uh, our experiences. <clears throat> We're also gonna try and share a brief video clip at one point. So if this goes wrong, I, I, can't, um, <clears throat> I can't guarantee it. And as it is near Christmas, and as it's lovely to talk to our neighbors in Dorset from where I am in Hampshire, I'm wearing a a slightly Christmas, Christmassy waistcoat for once. <clears throat> so hopefully, can you see the slides? Somebody nod. Yes, good, excellent. Uh, well, Michael has given you a perfect introduction uh, to this slide, really. Um, we obviously joined in the South Downs, a very august family of national parks, but had previously been to AONBs in Sussex and East Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So in a very similar position to the position that Dorset is in now. And obviously you can see the map there with all of the AONBs and national parks um, in um, uh, the UK, national parks in Scotland, of course, which has national scenic areas as well. Um, and uh, Michael also mentioned the Glover Review, which came out of the 25 year DEFRA strategy. Uh, 25 year plan and basically John uh, uh, Julian Glover was then given the task of looking at the protected landscapes around Britain and really starting to think what could those protected landscapes be doing in the future what might the next 50 years look like in the same way as um, the last 50 years and the experience of post-war rebuilding of Britain of which these national parks and protected landscapes AOMBs national trails were apart. The slides take a moment to move on, so I'm just going to do this. That's it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say, for those of you, some of you may know this area very well. I know parts of Dorset very well, not so much Dorchester, more Lyme Regis in that area, I have to say, and Swanage, but fabulous, fabulous areas both. Um, there are lots of similarities uh, and lots of similar issues in the discussion about whether the Dorset AMB and possibly East Devon should become a national park as they were in the South Downs. We are a complex lowland mixed farming landscape. In many ways, we feel more at home 
with many of our neighbouring A and Bs in terms of the issues we deal with and the sort of place we are than we do with our dear friends, the Upland National Parks. And in turn, of course, those national parks have a lot in common with their neighbouring A and Bs, the North Pennines, for example, with uh, Northumberland and Yorkshire Dales. <clears throat> This map shows you the extent of the South Downs National Park. It's a big area, 100 miles, uh, 116 square kilometres. Don't ask me why I always do that in kilometres. It's just the way the, uh, the, my brain works. And you can see there all the different landscape types. And they will all be very familiar to anyone who lives in Dorset. We have the Heritage Coast in the east. You have the Jurassic Coast, much more extensive, of course. Uh, you have the chalk, uh, various chalk landscapes running across from east to west, 100 miles from Eastbourne to Winchester. But also you have, and many people don't know this, to the north, the sort of brown areas on this map, you have the woods and heaths of the West Weald. In fact, the area I live in and I can see out of my window here. So actually a great variety of lowland landscapes on chalk and sandstone. No limestone here, of course. And the scale is fairly similar, by the way. If you look at the potential area that could be covered by Dorset National Park, which combined also parts of East Devon, it will be a very similar size and many of the other metrics would be the same. Right now, we're just gonna just try and very quickly share a video here. I'm gonna have a go at this. Gives you a little bit of a flavour and um, you'll see a lot of things that are very familiar, I think, from Dorset. Subtly different, of course, but, you know, the open chalk downland, um, rolling downland landscape, the heathlands, a lot of woodland, the coast and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of other things in this national park are very similar. It's a very beautiful place, but like Dorset, it's also an extremely busy place. And this slide just gives you a, a little bit of a snapshot of how busy it is. Um, 117,000 people live in the South Downs. Um, it provides water for over a million people. It's got three and a half thousand kilometres of rights of way. Um, it's got 176 parishes in it. So it's, it's a very big and busy area and more than two million people live within five kilometres of the boundary. Uh, so it's heavily visited, about 18 million visits a year. <clears throat> so it's not a tranquil place, although it does have tranquility in it, but it's certainly a very busy place. And a lot of challenges that uh, Michael described earlier in terms of how to manage all those different competing interests uh, that people have in the landscape. Just waiting for the slide to load. Yeah, nothing's happening. I don't know, we seem to have stuck here somehow. Sorry, bear with me. There's just nothing happening. I'm pressing the next slide and it's not moving. 
Aha. Right, that was a bit of a delay. I'm not quite sure why. Um, so we have a management plan in the South Downs, a partnership plan, which is a um, for the whole landscape of the National Park, not just for the National Park Authority. Uh, you, of course, have an AONB plan for Dorset as well, which is broadly very similar in terms of the sort of principles, but I'll mention some of the distance, uh, important differences as well. Uh, so that management plan, plan sets out a vision and an ambition and lots and lots of different projects, which different organisations that are involved, water companies, Forestry Commission, Wildlife Trust, all sorts of different organisations are involved in. Um, now, Michael mentioned the statutory functions that relate to national parks, and this is important, I think, and an important distinction from what an AONB is required to do by government. So for us, we have two purposes and a duty. The purposes are basically landscape, uh, conservation of landscape, wildlife and um, cultural heritage, and promoting understanding and opportunities for people, purpose one and purpose two, but very importantly, we have that social and economic duty as well that Michael mentioned with respect to the Peak District. So communities and the economy, and communities includes, of course, our market towns, uh, are very much hardwired into our national park setup uh, here in the South Downs. Uh, we have four market towns. We have Petersfield, where I live, which is uh, about 15,000 people. Lewis, 17,000. Uh, smaller towns in Petworth and Midhurst. Uh, so a little bit smaller, the biggest towns than Dorchester, but not, not that dissimilar. We're in the same kind of uh, sort of level of, of uh, community. And when we develop the special qualities for our national park that underpin everything we do, we consulted a lot of people, over a thousand of them, uh, and looked at all the evidence and all the reports. And this is what we came up with, this wheel. But I just wanted to point out the two uh, ringed in red because the towns and villages and the communities, the pride they have in their area, and the historical features and cultural heritage, much of which is in those towns and settlements, as well as in the landscape, those were very, very important special qualities. So the question of should the towns be in the national park? Well, interestingly, both Lewis and Petersfield campaigned vigorously to be in the national park. Uh, Petersfield as part of that West Weald and Lewis, because it is frankly embedded in the downs, right in a, in, in a strategic gap in the chalk ridge. So both of those towns very much wanted to be part of the, the national park and to get the benefits of it. Um, I'm going to quickly run through just to give you a flavour again. You, I think some people have asked, well, so what, what, what difference would the national park make to, to what goes on? Um, this it basically relates to our 10th anniversary because we actually, our shadow authority was set up in 2010. We went live in 2011. So this gives you just a bit of a flavour of some of the things we've been able to do as a park authority. And again, picking up what Michael said, because we have a more significant staff and membership than uh, an AOMB is able to have or lucky enough to have, uh, we're able to do a little bit more on these uh, fronts than would otherwise be possible. Nature recovery on a landscape scale, very important issue for us. There's a few statistics there. Uh, in terms of heathlands, 1,200 football pitches brought, uh, worth of heathland, that's not actual football pitches, have been brought into better management or areas have been extended and reconnected, river restoration, short grassland and so on. Working with farmers and larger estates, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute on a later slide. Uh, the first... Um, uh, very exciting for us, the designation of an international dark sky reserve in such a populated lowland landscape. Um, that was May 2019. And that in turn has brought a lot of interest uh, and a lot of visitors. We have a dark skies festival in February, which is now very popular. People get bookings in local B&Bs and cafes and restaurants at an otherwise dead time of the year. Astro tourism, it's now called. <clears throat> Access, very important for us, walking and cycling but also enabling access from the bus network and particularly the um, railway stations that we have in and around the South Downs. We're quite well served with those. I've got another slide on that later. Some big cultural heritage projects. We ran a project called Secrets of the High Woods, which basically mapped most of the central downs from an aircraft using LIDAR technology, uh, which picks up those tiny humps and bumps. And we discovered effectively vast areas of medieval farmed landscape and a lot of much more ancient archaeology underneath the wooded West Sussex Downs. 
So, so a whole exploration of a, a new, a whole new dimension of cultural heritage there. And that was enabled partly because we had the resources to make the bid and to bring together the partners um, and to do some match funding with the Heritage Lottery. Um, young people and uh, engaging people is a very, very important part of what we do. Uh, you've got some statistics there. We have 800 schools within five kilometres of the boundary. So a few schools in, not that many, but a few in the market towns and smaller village schools. But 870% of those have engaged with the national park in one way or the other. For example, we do travel grants for those who are <coughs> less able to book a coach and get out into the national park. And we've done a lot of work to raise the profile of the area in terms of the landscape, not in terms of the authority, in terms of the South Downs, uh, with entry signage, uh, with projects that use the visual identity that we've created, uh, and a lot of now social media work we're finding this year, bizarrely, in lockdown, we're engaging more people than we did before, and a more diverse range of people because they're able to go to virtual events, um, which they couldn't have otherwise done. So that gives you a little bit of flavour of some of the things that the National Park has done. Communities, I'm going to talk a little bit more about in, the minute, in a minute, but perhaps one important point to make there is that we decided early on to put in place the community infrastructure levy. We're the only National Park Authority in Britain that did that. Oh, sorry, in England, it doesn't apply elsewhere. Uh, and that means that we are able to raise a significant amount of money through this, what is effectively a, a tax on development. And that money can go back into projects into the National Park and also is top sliced back into town councils and parishes at a rate of 15 or 25 percent. Uh, so that's important because we can steer where that money goes and use it perhaps slightly differently to a traditional county and put it more into green infrastructure, community, environmental projects that help deliver our management plan. Um, I'm going to mention most of the other things uh, subsequently, so I'll move on from that slide. I mentioned farms, and again, Michael picked up on this earlier. We're dealing with all the same dis dis issues that he did in the Peak District, even though it's a very different landscape, lots of similar issues. Um, we are very lucky in the South Downs now to have six farm clusters. Um, these are led and created by farmers, supported by uh, Natural England, by water companies, but also all very actively supported by the National Park through our ranger teams and other staff. So that means two thirds of our national park is covered by a farm cluster. What does that mean? It means there's a group of farmers who work very actively together. And I know you have some in Dorset. I talked to Tom Munro about this recently, um, usually with a shared interest in the landscape, in particularly in nature conservation and wildlife on their farms, but also sharing best practice, managing access, looking at water quality and the rest of it. So these are a really important foundation for our future work in the National Park, having that relationship with farmers. But as we have over 900 holdings, we can't do it literally farm gate by farm mm. gate. So the clusters are useful and we would like to see them cover the whole National Park <clears throat> in due course. Uh, I mentioned cycling and walking um, earlier. This is something that my team produced a while back, which is our tube map for the South Downs, Eastbourne at the right hand end, Winchester at the left hand end, Alton and Hazelmere at the top and the Sussex coast at the bottom and the Hampshire coast. And this shows a whole network of routes which either already exist, are being built or we aspire to. And these are multi user routes, often for walkers, cyclists, horse, horse riders, buggies, uh, safe off road routes. Uh, a famous example links the centre of Brighton through Woodingdean up to the uh, universities and the football, uh, Premier League football at Falmer. Um, so that's a heavily used route, which actually goes right over the South Downs. So that we're able to do this kind of strategic planning, <coughs> excuse me, and also lever in resources by bringing different groups together. We work with four highway authorities, uh, Western East Sussex, Hampshire and Brighton Hove Unitary. So working with those uh, organisations, we can also then bring in money from, for instance, Department for Transport, which we've done quite successfully uh, in the past. I've mentioned the Dark Skies Reserve. I won't pause on that, so just let you look at the lovely photograph. That's a church quite near me up on the downs where you can see the Milky Way. It's not quite Bryce Canyon, but it's a pretty good dark sky for the southeast. 
<clears throat> now, planning. I'm sure you all want to talk about this, really. So first thing to say, I'm not a planner. My colleague, Tim Slaney, runs our planning department, but uh, we are very integrated in our national park. As Michael said earlier, we, we aim to be a joined up organisation that does, if you like, sustainable development on a landscape scale. So we work closely together. Um, planning, of course, is one of the important factors in, in the difference between an AOMB and a national park. Uh, national parks have their own planning service, local plans. Now, we have a very interesting model here. We are the biggest, but in terms of the volume of applications, we're in the top 20 um, in Britain. So, you know, the South Downs, the number of applications is up with sort of um, Birmingham, Greater Manchester and so on. So when we were set up, we put in place partnership arrangements. They're called Section 101 agreements with all of the local authorities that we overlap with. That's 15 of them, including the counties, districts, boroughs, unitaries, in order to deliver the planning service. Crudely, what this means is the big, more controversial set piece planning applications we deal with directly with our own planning committee, which, of course, you can access the same as any other planning committee and you make representations and you can make objections and you can appear in front of it. But we also delegate the smaller case, the caseload for the smaller planning applications to uh, host authorities who deliver that service on our behalf and we pay them per application determined. But very importantly, this is the crucial thing, there is one South Downs local plan which was adopted last year uh, that was the last in the sort of piece of policy that we needed to put in place for the South Downs. So Winchester to Eastbourne, one set of policies. So I'll come to the local plan. Um, so what's special about our local plan? Well, we like to think a number of things. Firstly, it is because it's in the National Park, it's landscape led. We started from that point of view, not from the point of view of trying to meet a housing target. I'll come back to landscape in a minute. However, we recognise the National Park needs to be vibrant, its communities need to grow and develop. So what we have done in our plan is gone for, if you like, medium distributed growth. We don't, as a National Park, have to meet an objective, objectively assessed housing need. Uh, but we, are, we do have a significant amount of development in our local plan, and we have tried to disperse that across not only the market towns, but quite a lot of the smaller settlements, many of whom need a small amount of housing in order to remain viable as communities in the long term. And many of those communities told us they wanted some of that. Very importantly, the local plan is built on neighbourhood plans. I'll come back to that. We have a lot of green policies in it to do with natural capital, ecosystem services, design and so on. And affordable housing is also a key part of the <coughs> local plan. So we like to think this, if you like, 21st century style national park local plan is a bit different to what you would have had if you just had the, uh, uh, the districts or boroughs. The spatial approach, you can see on that map, you can just about see our outline in there, means that we have policies that are fine-tuned within a single framework to particular parts of the National Park, but not on the old administrative boundaries. For example, the Springline villages that lie at the foot of the Downs facing north, whether they're in Hampshire or East Sussex, have a whole set of similar characteristics, history, and they've involved a particular settlement pattern. So the policies reflect that. And we've championed neighbourhood and community-led plans. Uh, we took a pretty active and deliberate decision earlier on to do that. Some, I have to say, some of our neighbouring local authorities, not all of them, were really quite dismissive of these sorts of initiatives, particularly neighbourhood development plans that were new then. We've really gone for it. We've developed, I think, a centre of expertise in this, supporting our own communities in the park, and now actually providing consultancy services for some outside as well. And the benefit of that for us has been that over 50 parishes have got neighbourhood plans now, and the vast majority of the housing that has been allocated, or land that has been allocated for housing in the local plan, has been allocated through neighbourhood plans, bottom up, working with those communities. So that's been a huge benefit. It also means that we're plugged into networks of activists in all of those communities. Not all simple, of course. I mean, all sorts of rows and fights locally. My own town here of Petersfield spent two years arguing about where the optimum place is to put new housing, but they agreed and it's in the neighborhood plan. So that's a big, big plus. 
So as I say, the local plan is underpinned by these community-led plans, particularly the neighbourhood development plans, which are a statutory part of a local plan wherever they occur, inside or outside national parks. But the other thing we do, we have a lot of large rural estates, uh, again, similar to Dorset, uh, in, in our case, particularly in West Sussex, but some in eastern Sussex and Hampshire. And we wanted to work with those strategically and long term. We also have large areas of land owned by people like Brighton and Hove City Council, Worthing Downland, Eastbourne Downland. And we even have some schools, private schools with quite large uh, estates. So we developed a tool, which is a whole estate plan encouraging those estates to bring forward uh, their thoughts about the future, about where they're trying to go as a business and as an estate or as a family if it's privately owned, and not only to look at their built assets and whether they want to convert a particular building for a particular purpose and then get planning permission for it, but actually to look at their natural assets as well, to look at their landscape, their natural capital, the services that provides so that they are laying out what they would like to do with that in the future. This has two benefits to us. One is it means our planning decisions are better informed. It doesn't mean the estates get everything they want, but it does mean when applications come to the planning committee that they are against a context of what that estate is trying to do. And the other benefit is we again build up that long-term contact with those estates who control a lot of the landscape. Uh, so what they do is vitally important. It's within their gift. There are lots of local initiatives that have sprung out of all this community level work. This is one example, the Petersfield Eye Tree Survey, which basically conducted an exhaustive audit of literally every street tree and every town tree in Petersfield. This has been done in some London boroughs, it uses a toolkit that was developed in America. That audit means there's a baseline now for the future to make sure that the town I live in stays as green as it is now or gets better. We, we actually increase the amount of uh, street trees and uh, urban trees. Sorry, I have to wait for this to go sometime. There we are. Um, high quality design, I'm sure all local authorities would flame their champion high quality uh, design. Who would want to champion low quality design? But in a national park and with that brand, if you like, that cachet, we do use that to push developers quite hard. This is Lewis Depot Cinema, uh, the county town of East Sussex, Lewis. And it is basically a conversion and extension of the old Harvey's Brewery Depot. And it has won numerous awards now for the quality of its design, but also the facilities it produces. It's a real community hub, cinema, bar, cafe, meeting place, or at least it was until COVID and hopefully will soon be again. <clears throat> and I mentioned affordable rural housing earlier, like you, Rural house prices are way in excess of the average here. But what we have tried to do is a whole bunch of things, really looking at free pre-app advice, helping community land trusts to find local sites for affordable housing, encouraging some of our rural estates that I mentioned earlier to bring forward sites, providing grants, which we take out of section 106 payments to top up um, the developers to produce small amounts of rural, rural affordable, affordable housing, which is very difficult, as you will know. It's much easier in a town where you can do quite a large project. Uh, and we're part of a national pilot to access funds for rural, <coughs> sustainable rural housing delivery. Finally, I'll just whiz through these quickly because it'd be good to get in some discussion. Four big challenges for the future. I noticed very similar ones in the Dorset AOMB management plan. So these are not particular to national parks. But being a national park, we have a bit more resource to deal with it. So those four key challenges. One is nature recovery. We are in a stage of a history now where I think we all recognise it's not good enough to try and stop further damage. We actually need to build back biodiversity, particularly in Britain, which unfortunately, although it looks nice in some areas, is one of the most nat nature depleted countries in the world. So better management of sites, expanding sites, linking them together. You have a fabulous example of this in Wild Purbeck, for example, which we, we are very envious of and we'd like to do more of that sort of thing. But we are trying to do that, take that approach with some of the habitats uh, in the national park. The second big challenge is tackling the climate emergency. And what I would say there is, whereas many businesses, many communities, all local authorities now, almost without exception, are committed to do something on this. 
often have quite uh, challenging long-term targets for to be net zero emissions. Um, what we can do in a national park in particular is working with our communities to take them into that low energy scenario uh, pathway because of the links that we have, but also to work with the land managers because the way land is managed in lowland England will also have a very significant effect on the climate. It's both whether the landscape's resilient to climate change, but also by judicious woodland planting, by changing the way arable cropping works, by using wetlands as carbon sinks, whether we can make the landscape work as part of the climate solution. So that, that relies on our contact with landowners. Uh, a very important part of the Glover Review was landscapes for everyone. Now, like the Dorset AOMB, and actually I'm afraid every protected landscape, pretty much without exception, and despite many good intentions, we are still predominantly used by people who are older than younger, more than younger, uh, often middle-aged, white, middle-class people, men like myself with white hair. If you look at the area around the South Downs, that is no way representative of the communities that surround us. We have far mm. more ethnic diversity around us. We have much larger, um, uh, we have much younger populations in some of the big towns, coastal towns, Crawley uh, to the north as well, and other towns. But also we have people who, although they live cheek by jowl with the protected landscape, in the case of Brighton or haven't, literally against the boundary, never going to the national park and it's very important to us to reach out to those people to find out what would make them comfortable visiting to encourage them to come in and get the benefits of this fabulous place but also to work with the landowners who may otherwise worry about that and, and visitor pressure and so on and the last one of all the final uh, challenge is of course the economy um kind of speaks for itself. The economy of the South Downs is actually surprisingly big, and I'm quite sure it is in Dorset and uh, East Devon as well. 8,000 businesses in our national park. They are going through an enormous transition, even pre-COVID, because of leaving the EU. And whatever your politics are, whether you were a Remainer or whether you were a Lever, the plain fact is a lot of EU funds went into rural development, supporting farming and land management, agri-environment schemes. We're now in a very different world of creating our own system from scratch, which does give opportunities, but that's a hugely important process that we have to help our businesses through. And I thought at the end, I'm sure there are lots of questions you have in your own mind, so I'm going to skip over that slide and run out of time. Um, here's some thoughts from me, particularly for Dorchester, I think. Um, should you be in a national park if one was to come about? Which I hope it will, for your sake. Well, national parks are the premier landscape brand. Sorry to, to say that, but they are. Um, AOMBs are fabulous and do a brilliant work for the resources they have, but national park status does give you that extra cachet uh, and you might want to be associated with that. There are more resources uh, in terms of planning, in terms of ranger services and other specialists to do big projects and communications. There isn't a democratic deficit. I mean, I can talk more about that later, but I think that's a, that's an illusion. But most importantly, I think it's what you make of it. And I speak from the heart now, thinking of my own town here of Petersfield in East Hampshire. A lot of the benefits of being in or even near a national park um, come if you choose them. It's whether you want to use that uh, landscape uh, identity as a way of regenerating a town, of... Uh, of putting the emphasis on local food, on sustainability, on nature, on walking and cycling, on ecotourism. There are lots of potential benefits if you want to embrace them. For planning, it matters where the boundary is, because you're either in a national park local plan, if you were to get one, or not. For all the other benefits, it doesn't. It, just the fact that you're close is what matters, because people would come and stay, as they already do, in Dorchester to come and visit other parts of the uh, protected landscape. So my view would be seize the opportunity. But over to you. Thank you very much, Tess. And well, I'll stop there. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you want to throw at me.
And to hear your points of view. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, does anybody have a question that they have ready to ask? And if so, can you either use the virtual symbol or hand symbol or your put your hand up yourself so that we can uh, um, ask you to, uh, to speak? If so, if not, I can start off with one just to get everyone going. I think um, Paul, Paul Kimber's got a question oh, there. Thanks. thanks, Claire. Paul, would you like to ask your question? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was really lovely to, to hear Mike, uh, Michael uh, and uh, Andrew speak. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm totally for uh, a national park in Dorset. In fact, um, you know, we, we pushed it right the way through the old Weymouth and Portland Council, and I, th I think it's even gone via the Portland Town Council as well. And it also once went to the old Dorset County Council. Um, Andrew, what I was interested in is how you managed to deal with housing need. This is a massive, massive problem in in Dorset, and it also must have been in in your, in, in your area now. I just wondered how, how you're getting over the demand for housing. Thank you. You're muted, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Do you want me to take each one in turn, Tess, or, or take a group? I don't mind. Which. Um, are there any more related to housing issues? that could be taken at once. Is anybody else? Um, sorry, is that you, Stella? With your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, mm. is there a question? Yes, uh, I'm, yes, several points. First of all, the, the new Dorset plan, which is just being out for consultation, is based on government numbers for housing. Does the National Park, be, is it told how many houses it has to have? And, what, and uh, or can you just choose the numbers you want? And if, parts of Dorset were in the National Park, would the rest of the housing have to go, uh, that, that you didn't want, have to go in the rest of Dorset that wasn't in the National Park? And secondly, um, how, when you, you do your housing, your affordable housing, how do you, do you have a housing committee that allocates um, people into housing, like Dorset Council has a housing committee? Um, and how do you look after your, the homeless who need housing desperately? Thank you. Stella, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, I think, Stella, you give me about five questions. That's very yeah, smart. Okay. Um, so so both of you, actually, Paul, Paul and um, and Stella, firstly, on the on the general housing issue. So to be clear, first of all, I mean, of course, technically, no council currently has to meet a housing target, although that can all change with the planning white paper. What they have to do is demonstrate that they have tried to yeah. meet objectively assessed housing need. Sorry to be pedantic, but that's yeah, slightly exactly. different. Yeah, that, yeah. There may be reasons why they can't. Now, but that doesn't apply in national parks at all. And that's been tested, that principle's been tested in law um, a number of times. Uh, there are plenty of QCs with, um, with the, they're the scars. So in a national park and in our national park, we did not have to meet objectively assessed housing need. We looked, we cover four housing market areas. We looked at all the same data as any local authority would. And we then came up with a figure and an approach we felt the landscape and the communities could accommodate. Which, by the way, is still probably nearly as much and in some cases more than the local authorities were doing anyway in the rural parts of Sussex and Hampshire that now make the South Downs. So there is a myth that's developed that once the National Park came, there'd be no housing. It's not true at all. Um, and of course, there's an opposite myth that being in a national parks made di no difference. Well, Petersfield has 850 houses allocated in a town of 15,000. Um, I think you probably know what some of the housing pressure is on some other similar sized communities in other parts of England. I, I could use Kent as an example. Um, so we have definitely been able to put in an approved and adopted local plan lower housing figures than we might otherwise have been expected to do. Uh, on your other point, does it push housing out? Well, I mean, it depends on your view, doesn't it? If, if you talk to some people here in some local authorities, Chichester is a good example, 
They have an AOMB to the south and a European wildlife site. They have a national park to the north and a lot of the rest of the districts in a floodplain. So Chichester feels very squeezed and some people in Chichester blame us for the problem that they're trying to deal with, mm. meeting housing need. Um, but my answer to that is it's no different to what it was before. It's a problem of geography. Uh, the, the, open, the downland is not a good place to put lots of housing. It never was. I mean, it's, it has statutory backing now in the National Park. Um, so the, prop, the challenges for Chichester are locational. But yes, there are huge housing pressures in the co on the coast of Sussex and Hampshire at the moment. And of course, with the planning white paper, uh, if we have the zoning system that's being proposed, and that's a big if, then we would expect national parks to be in the protected category. You're not allowed to use the word tier now, are you? Protected category. <laughs> Um, now, that's an interesting in terms of democratic deficit, because, again, we are accused sometimes of, of that. My response to that is our planning committee is extremely responsive and very, very well informed by local opinion. What we don't have, to be fair, is ward councillors, mm. because our planning committee covers the whole national park. But we tend to remember to look at the large planning applications, not the dormitories and extensions. Um, I would argue that makes our planning committee better because they can be very objective and strategic. Um, and they're certainly just as accessible, accessible as any local authority around us. Um, so can we choose the numbers? Uh, well, yes, because we had a local plan adopted with the figures that we put in. But we had to show we'd looked at housing need. Of course, we couldn't just say nothing. That would have been absurd and wrong. And on affordable housing, um, <laughs> this is where it gets complicated. We're not the housing authority. We are the National Park Authority, so we're the planning authority, but not the housing authority. So it's the districts and boroughs who decide how the affordable housing is used, but we can facilitate the, 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 those sites to come forward and work with estates and developers and uh, communities to try and get those places to come forward. Uh, we have an acute affordable housing problem. And yes, we have a, a serious homelessness issue as well. But that, of course, is focused on the coastal towns at the moment, particularly. I hope that answers some of the questions. Yes, thank you. I'll come back later. Are there other questions now? For... Susie. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, going back to the issue of democratic uh, defi deficit, um, it would be really helpful to know how your planning committee is, is made up and how it's um, chosen. Uh, I, I, I gather the members are not elected, but it would be useful to know how that's um, drawn up. Yeah, happy to take that one now. Um, Susie, yes, nice to meet you. Um, right, I should have said this earlier, probably. So the way national parks work is there's a formula, basically, that DEFRA has. And uh, essentially, about half of our members, of our 27 members, that's 14 of them, are local authority members. So they are all elected. Um, but obviously, they're elected by their local authorities, and then they're put on the National Park Board, if you like. They're not elected directly to us. Um, five of our members... Um, sorry, uh, six of our members altogether are national appointments by DEFRA. So they're people who have been appointed because they have expertise in landscape or planning or communities or some other interest uh, that, and, and they are, uh, want to commit themselves to the national park. Usually, not always, usually they're local. I mean, actually all our nas nationally appointed members are local, or usually local residents or people who live on the edge of the park. And then a further six... And this is very important to us in terms of the point you're making, Susie, are elected through the parishes and put forward onto the MPA. So we have two parish members in East Sussex, two in West Sussex, two in Hampshire. So they work with all of the parishes in the national park part of their county. Uh, they regularly convene them. We have, I've just come off a round of parish meetings last week. We, we, we do uh, regular workshops with all of our parishes. So there's a parish rep set of representatives, there's local authority representatives, but remember they're not on the MPA to represent their local authority. They have to take that hat off and put on a broader hat. And then there's the national members. 
And I'm sorry, the planning committee, you asked about the planning committee. The planning committee has a mixture of all of them, but we always make sure there's a strong local authority um, uh, balance on that, partly because uh, local authority members tend to know a lot about planning. Some of them chair planning committees themselves or been on them, so that's useful. But it's also quite useful to have some of these other people on as well. You might just have a broader um, expertise about planning or design and other issues. Thank you very much. That's that's really helpful to clarify that. Um, just one one add on. Um, when you say parish members, does that include town councils as well, or is it just parishes? It's town councils as well. Yes, town councils as well. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Was did you have your hand up? Yes. I uh, just noticed that Andrew said that the parishes had very often prepared their own local um, plans community plans and, and I think that is a major plus for the parishes to be able to do that because the parishes in my ward certainly feel very frustrated they don't have any say in planning they can actually be encouraged to, to, to produce a community plan and then work to it and it's, it's the respect is paid to it uh, I think some of them would go for it at the moment they don't want to I think that would be a big plus in, in terms of democracy. Thank you. Yes, I should say, and, and to make it very clear, that there's nothing unique about the fact that we promoted neighbourhood plans. Any local authority could and should have done that, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, it happens that some of our neighbours didn't, um, and we chose to, But it's and, and we would see it as an integral part of what we do as a national park. But there's nothing that says that national park authorities should support neighbourhood plans more than anybody else. It has been useful... And also notably, it has been unhelpful for one or two communities, Midhurst as an example, which is ironically where our head office is, who chose not to do a neighbourhood plan and are now, I'm afraid, reaping some of the consequences because there's quite a lot of factions in the community who can't agree with what should be happening. And of course, they're just subject to allocations in our local plan and things that are being driven by developers because they chose not to do a neighbourhood plan. It is a lot of work, takes a lot of commitment, but I think... It, it has been worth it. Of course, it may all change again with the planning white paper. Gareth. Hello, Andrew. Uh, I must say, uh, superb to hear Michael's uh, Michael's introduction, and uh, very uplifting to hear your uh, to hear your presentation as well. Thank you very much. Um, you say that. Um, uh, you, you delegate some of your uh, planning decision work to, to local authorities. Um, have, have you experienced um, sort of resistance or difficulties in, in doing that? And do you find that the, um, that the planning, that the officers delegated to do the work uh, start implementing, sort of taking decisions that more reflect the authority from which they come rather than the national park? Uh, what's an astute question, Gareth? As always, you know when people ask questions like that, they already know the answer. But um, yeah, it's 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 not simple. Um, first of all, some of the authorities that overlapped the South Downs only in a tiny area, Eastbourne was an example. Um, they just handed back the planning service to us. There was no point in them trying to run a different kind of planning service for a little bit of the Eastbourne Downland when they've got the whole town to focus on. So we just do everything there. But the big planning authorities, that's Lewis, uh, for, for us, that's Lewis, Chichester, East Hampshire and Winchester. They do account for a great deal. You know, the majority of planning applications determined in our national park are determined by them. And they are now determined by them to our policies. Realistically, what you said, all those things are true. We've had all sorts of turf wars. We've had planning officers who get confused about which policies operate. We've got some planning officers who we felt were still perhaps a little too influenced by their, if you like, home authority and others where the home authority probably thought was a sort of national park team that had gone a bit native. So it's been a bit of a learning experience. But I would say for those big four, it's a really good model. And we've worked through it. We meet them regularly. We have quarterly official meetings to review the Section 101 agreements. And we've done quite a lot of training and support for the officers in those authorities who are delivering um, planning service in the national park. So they understand national park purposes and duty. They understand our local plan and our management plan as well. Um, the alternative, interesting, I mean, the alternative, the traditional model would have meant we'd have an enormous planning department, which would completely dwarf and swamp everything else we do. 
our ranger teams and my strategy leads and our national park communications and education work. So we were very reluctant to do that, just to create one big bureaucracy. Uh, it's not just, perfect, it's messy, but on the whole, it works. And as a supplement to that, do you find that the, uh, uh, the officers who, uh, let's say, have to deal with some, work, some planning within, within the National Park and some out, do they find themselves uh, lent on by members who also, whose constituencies also cross the boundaries? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes. I mean, I think the issue, one of the issues for us, and we made this point recently in a meeting with Tom Munro from Dorset AMB and from Elaine, with Elaine King from the Chilterns, uh, which um, one of the points we made is if you do, if you are on track to be considered as a national park, look very hard at the boundary because the boundaries are set on landscape grounds, which given my background, I kind of approve of, but it has created a lot of split parishes. And that can be very difficult for those parishes. You know, when you're saying to them, there's a local plan for the national park here and for the district or borough here. And, and you're right, for some members, that's confusing as well. Members outside, it's more straightforward. They're outside, they may like the national park, they may not because they think they're pushing the housing to them. Members inside, of course, represent communities in the national park. So actually, you know, it's in their interest to work with us. But those split um, split parishes, that can be quite difficult. So there is an argument for, I think, juggling the boundary a bit to make it a bit neater in terms of administration. You, you, can, do you can do that. Oh, we can't do that. No, I mean, the, the, to try and change the national park boundary requires a, 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 an elaborate and lengthy process, mm. although Glover's talking about simplifying it. But I think what I'm saying is if a new boundary is put into place it would be worth looking hard at that at the time because once you've designated it you know we, we don't want to get into boundary issues because it may be messy but we work with it and trying to reopen that particular can of worms you know there were two public inquiries for the south downs and so field by field were, was argued about we don't really want to go back there we'd rather concentrate on getting on with the job <clears throat> thank you thank you are there any further questions Roland? Roland, is that another one? Well, I'd just like to ask Andrew to say something about the ranger service because uh, here they're very overworked and paths are getting overgrown and things aren't getting done because they're too few of them on the ground. I'm wondering how the National Park uh, designation affects that. Sorry, I didn't catch the end of that, Roland. You said he he here in Dorset they're very overworked and. Um, yes, it, 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 things aren't being done as well as they used to be, <laughs> if we see as I say. Um, and I, I believe in the National Park, we probably have better funding for the ranger service than we do. For yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's one of the great assets we have. I mean, we took on some rangers from the AOMBs or the joint committee, which came between the AOMBs and the National Park. But since then, a lot of new people have come in. Uh, I've got about 25 rangers. They're split, I say about, because there's some apprentices and some part-timers and so on. Um, they're split into four area teams. So we are, compared with an AOMB, very well off for rangers. Um, I know I'm biased, but I'm always amazed at the quality of people we get. We, they're very, very far nowadays from people who just, you know, clear scrub or put in fence posts. They're doing community engagement. They're doing education. They're doing outreach. They're doing all sorts of things. Are they enough? No, absolutely not. I mean, interestingly, even farmers who are critical of the National Park on principle, because it's a bloody bureaucracy, always say, but we'd like more rangers, please. Because they love the rangers, because they're feet on the ground and local face and, and people they can work with. And as Michael said at the beginning, that liaison between landowners and visitors. Um, but, but yes, we have a strong ranger service and we also work with a lot of other bodies like the National Trust, Natural England and Forestry Commission who have their own rangers. Um, we haven't quite got, what I would like to get to is where the Cairngorms I think is, where you really have got one ranger service, which is the National Park, regardless of who employs them. We haven't quite got to that. But uh, yes, we're we are much better off, um, but you know, it's still 25 people and it's still 1,600 square kilometres and, you know, 900 farmers. So. <clears throat> Jane, I think you've, you've got your hand up. 
Yes, uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, and likewise, terrific uh, speakers and presentations tonight from, from uh, both gentlemen. Um, I guess um, somewhat of a novice to this, so a couple of, of issues. What is the kind of current status of any initiative in, in, our, in the county with regard to um, national park status? And given the um, Michael's initial presentation, um, where would the Ministry of Defence and the Army fit, fit into, you know, any any proposal? I, I don't know whether the South Downs has, has any um, MOD Ministry of, De, you know, Defence uh, land, but you know that sounds like that was a major barrier uh, back in the in in the forties and fifties. I can answer the second bit, Jane, but obviously yeah. the main bulk of your question is for other people here. Uh, it's not been an issue at all for us, and we have a big military uh, range at Longmore and Woolmer Forest, um, although the army is now moving out of parts of it. Uh, and in fact, some of our most precious and important heathland is MOD land. Um, the existence of the National Park has not been an issue at all. Dealing with the MOD's bureaucracy has been an issue, but not the fact it's a National Park. <clears throat> Thank you. Would anybody, Gareth, are you picking up on? Uh, no, it's, it's a separate question. Right. Um, M Michael, uh, well, Michael and I uh, discussed when, when I was working as the Economic De Development Officer, we discussed um, uh, the development of rural workspace. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the features that, 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 that I suspect is the local plan is exacerbating is lack of workspace in, in rural areas. Um, how, how proactively do you uh, pursue the development of rural workspace to, to support local communities, local villages, settlements to become more sustainable? Uh, yeah, thanks, Gareth. Well, I think very proactively. I mean, first of all, in terms of the local plan policies supporting the rural economy, I think actually we're, I know you asked about the land allocation, I'll come to that. I think our policies are more enabling of rural business than the average district or borough, which actually surprised people. They thought because we we're a national park, we we're only interested in butterflies. Well, no, we specialise in the rural economy. <laughs> and without a rural economy, there's no landscape management. So, so we've got strong policies in the local plan. Uh, we obviously have allocated employment land and we protect, try and protect employment land. That's very difficult, particularly in the towns, because everybody wants it for housing, of course. You know, the, the owners of those sites always want housing. Uh, there's been lots of cases in terms of the viability test of, you know, proving that the commercial use is not viable in order to get housing. And, and we've, we've always tried to defend the employment land. But also I have a team who specialise now in the economy, not just farming, but all sorts of rural enterprise. And we're setting up an enterprise network, particularly for food and drink, tourism and land based businesses. Um, so we're trying to do a lot of different things. We're also working with the counties on things like rural broadband, which obviously is a massive issue for us, and I'm sure for you as well. Mm. Uh, obviously, other people have the tools there. You know, it's open reach. It's the county council that gets the money, but we can work with the local communities who might be able to get the broadband. So, yes, we, it's a big part of what we do. Thank you. Oh, and we had a COVID recovery fund this year, and we put... We put small grants into 60, we took some money out of our reserves and we put grants into 61 local businesses or enterprises or cultural heritage attractions to try and help them in the COVID year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Thanks very much indeed. I wonder if it would just be helpful if I just um, clarified the position uh, that Jane had asked on. Um, Andrew mentioned about the Glover Review, and the Glover Review um, proposed that Dorset um, and a couple of other areas be seriously considered to be evaluated as future national parks. Um, last month, the government reiterated its decision, its, its uh, commitment in the manifesto that it would create new national parks. And we're now pressing the government of Natural England to get on with the evaluation of Dorset. They were interrupted in that evaluation a couple of years ago by the Glover Review. So we hope that they will have the resources to be able to get on and do that. 
Could I just also just come back um, just to add to supplement to what Andrew was saying, and I think it was an answer to a question by Stella um, on would housing effectively be pushed out from the national park into other adjacent areas. And this is um, a, a unique um, opportunity for like for Dorset, which doesn't exist in the South Downs. <clears throat> and if I can just um, look at my script so I get the words precisely right. Um, the National Planning Practice Guidance at NPPG says that where a national park shares an area with a local planning authority, and in this case, that would be the Dorset Council as a unitary authority, then a local methodology may be used for calculating housing need rather than the national formula with its resulting housing targets. So the Dorset Council in partnership with the Dorset National Park could agree on a level of housing development for the whole of rural Dorset that appropriately reflects local needs, taking account of household projections and economic um, aims. So I hope that that's helpful. And I think Andrew, you would say that we're perhaps in a unique position because we have a unitary council and within that we would have a national park, therefore a unique one-to-one -one opportunity to work together. And indeed we have suggested that your devolved system of planning is taken even further and that the national park would develop a shared local plan with the Dorset Council and would have a shared planning team to deliver on that. So co-located um, and actually paid, for, well, partly paid for, of course, by the National Park out of its central government grant. So I hope that's helpful clarification. I see Andrew nodding. <laughs> it's always reassuring. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I mean, we are currently facing, as I am sure that Andrew uh, and, and the, the earlier speaker uh, are aware, uh, with a massive development just to the north of the Water Meadows. Now, I don't think that's got very much to do with local opinion uh, or local feelings at all. This is simply the Dorset Council feeling obliged to meet the requirements of national government. Um, this could destroy the town and I don't think would necessarily help uh, the future prospects for a national park. What I'm interested to know, following the Glover review and the fact that Dorset was one of sort of three recommended potential national parks. It was alarming to hear from Andrew that there were two presumably long running public inquiries. Uh, I don't know how many years it took to establish the South Downs National Park, but I'm thinking it's probably several generations. However, with the, uh, with the, the good news from the Glover, how realistic is it uh, that the possible uh, damage to the town of Dorchester, and I would suggest the county of Dorset, by the proposed local plan, could be stopped were we to be designated a national park within, say, two or three years. Um, is that possible, or are we talking about a decade or more? And will I only hear about the Dorset National Park when I'm either up in heaven or possibly down in hell? Yeah, that might be more of a question from some of your local colleagues, maybe Richard. Now, it, because the processes might change with Glover, that's my point. Um, mm. Designating a new national park will always take quite a long time, and it, and it should, because there's a big democratic element to deciding it, you know, with the inquiries and the boundary. Um, but Richard may have had discussions about that. Um, South Downs, well, pick your number. Camp first campaign was in the 30s. Uh, it was rejected post-war, as was explained earlier. Not wild enough, not mountainous enough, I suppose, putting it bluntly. Uh, and then I suppose the latter campaign took about 15 years, uh, ending in the two public inquiries. Um, but it doesn't have to take that long. And a new style national park type designation, and we were talking to the Chilterns and Dorset a and the other day about this, it might be a much, much more streamlined process. And also don't forget the planning white paper because you know you've got to factor this in too because you know the proposals are so radical in terms of the three zones which all of England would be in you know that that's got to go in the mix as well. Uh, we're not going to do it by Christmas then are we? <laughs> what a nice present that would be. Um, so I'm going to ask Mark Lane from the committee if he would just give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Tess. 
what an evening we've had. We've had the largest audience for any civic society uh, lecture and presentation. And we've had the privilege of two tremendous lecturers taking us back to pre-war, right bang up to date to a national park that is just 10 years old this year. So it would be my privilege to say thank you very much to both Michael and Andrew for a very insightful, helpful and informative talk this evening. I have learned a lot about national parks today. I remain committed to it personally, and uh, I hope that Dorset is quickly following the initiatives that Andrew and Michael and his father and his mother have put forward over the years for the benefit of national parks. So gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your presentations and thank you for your commitment to the national park movement. Thank you, thank you. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Michael speaking. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was and the very good. best of luck to you all. And Thank I'll you. be in Dorset soon when we're allowed again. We hope so. Thank Have you. Have a good Christmas. Thank you, Michael.